in studio. Good morning. Happy New Year, sir. Good morning. Same to you. Good to see you. Thank you very much. You look very well. You look prosperous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, see your cheeks are filled out. <laughs> it's hereditary. Yeah, it's hereditary. But how, how is it going at the party headquarters, director of communications? Um, what do you see? Uh, right now, if I may, this is my first time on the show mm. this year. Right. So uh, it's in order that I greet your viewers mm -hmm. and wish them a very prosperous uh, year right. as we recover right. uh, from COVID. Uh, difficult as it is for all of us, mm -hmm. I think together we will be on track. Now, when it comes to the party, mm. uh, this year we are renewing the party. We have internal elections uh, from polling station level right through to national level. Right. So you're looking at the possibility of 265,000 in excess mm. positions mm. Uh, being, being filled. And, and so we've developed a timetable. We do this every four years All according right. to our constitution. Okay. So this is the fourth year. Uh, in, in February, mm. 19th February, uh, over every polling station where the EC conducted a vote, in 2020, mm. we experience elections from us because our constitution demands that every police station is manned by five persons That's right. chairman, secretary, organizer, women organizer, mm. youth organizer. So, nearly 40,000 polling stations by the EC. Mm -hmm. So, you're looking at nearly 200,000. 200,000 people. And that means that in excess of three, 350, 400,000 people will apply. Right. Which is very interesting. Mm. It shows a certain interest in the party, a certain. Mm energy at a certain drive. Beyond that, we'll do electoral area mm -hmm. uh, coordinator elections. Following that, we'll do the constituency executive elections across 275 constituencies. Mm -hmm. And then we do 16 regional elections. By July uh, 14th to 16th, we'll have the national executive mm -hmm. uh, elections. Are you, are you running again? Uh, no, I yeah, not run, no, 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 But I see that some of your colleagues who said on the neck are, are running again and they have competitors coming up again. How is that, um, if you will, shaking up the party, people holding themselves up? Because obviously after every election, there seems to be some rebuilding process like this. It's performance-based. Mm. Uh, like you asked, I'm not running for general secretary. Okay. I've run so many times before. Mm. It's performance-based. Okay. And whoever is in a party position, is mm -hmm. accountable to the people right. at the end of the day. And, and the, the rules are very clear. Mm. Uh, you are, and you are, your duty is to mobilize mm. the people around government policies and, and drive support for the government during elections and in between elections. And so the community will measure you according to those uh, performance indices. Mm. And if you qualify it, uh, they will return you right. to office. So, so that we are having elections doesn't mean that everybody will change. Mm. Performance will be kept by the party. Okay. Yes, those who perform will be will voted, be kept. will be mm. kept by those who vote. I see. Yeah. The, the 2016 election, I mean, unprecedented, as you called it, and, mm. and everybody else, electoral commission's records will show that the NPP came on uh, top of the sitting government, for, for want of a better expression, won by one million votes unprecedented victory, landslide. But then in 2016, 2020, you have a hung parliament on your hands. You lost most of the seats that you had from 169 to now 137. How did the party receive that news? The party, as it always does, after every election, set up uh, an inquiry, mm. uh, a committee to inquire into the causes, whether we win or lose. Right. And this time it was led by the Honorable uh, Safu Mafu, okay. uh, former senior minister, mm. now a senior presidential advisor. Mm. And they have come up with, with uh, the various reasons why. But clearly, it's, it looks like it's region and constituency specific. Because okay. well, the president did very well. Mm. Yes, the president did very well. Even though he dropped votes, his 500,000 margin was still the second highest ever mm. in, in the eight elections we've had in the Republic. So, so the president did very well. That's half of what you got in 20, he got in 2016. Exactly. It exactly. means that half of the people who supported him in 2016 Incumbency departed. Mm. has a tendency to <laughs> whip you a little harder than mm. you would expect. Okay. Because when you are an incumbent, just mm. like now, mm -hmm. you have to grapple with and confront the problems of the day. Okay. Problems that sometimes you don't even anticipate. And most of those problems demand immediate solutions. 
in in today's democracy, you don't have halfway houses. Mm. Everybody wants everything; they want it fast. So, so incumbency tends to kind of uh, drain uh, goodwill uh, a bit. But at the end of the day, the resilience of the substantive policies still count. Were you surprised that the results of the 2020 elections, 137 uh, and then six million apiece? Were you surprised? Uh, a bit. <laughs> you were surprised. Why were you surprised? <laughs> I, I, I hadn't expected the, the quality of our policies. I believe were policies that impact on Ghanaians. Mm. You know, we, we had to deal with fundamental issues affecting lifestyles of mm. Ghanaians. Mm. And then having successfully exited the IMF uh, program, we had... During that time, in spite of the conditionalities, we had also been able to start implementing our flagship programs. Mm. Uh, and, and those programs were programs that impact on our key issues, social vulnerabilities, uh, employment, you know, uh, incomes, and, and, and access to education and health. Uh, those were core things that we got involved mm. with, as well, of course, as infrastructure, uh, roads, the energy sector, uh, uh, digitization and all that, all moving our pace. Uh, and then uh, we had that kind of result. Uh, and, 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 uh, and of course, I was included as well. I lost right. my seat. Right. So mm. uh, it was kind of surprising. Mm. I see. Mm. Now, you speak about the uh, policies, mm. free SHS, one district, one factory, one village, one dam, one constituency, one million dollars, uh, one constituency, one ambulance, uh, planting for export and rural development. Yeah. Uh, rearing for food and jobs, yeah. all of those ones that came up. What kind of monitoring and evaluation mechanism does the party have to measure whether or not the, the project or policy is doing very well, whether it has to be redirected? Do you have anything of the sort? We have an mm. interface with the government. Okay. So essentially, being part of the ruling government, the, the party is that which gave birth to the ruling government. Right. So the ruling government's mechanisms are available to the party. And the ruling government has set up a monetary and evaluation ministry, mm. if you recall. That's right. Yes. Uh, Dr. Kutua says ministry. Dr. Kutua says, but it's no more. No, it's now in the presidency. Okay. It's, it's a secretariat in the presidency. So, so that monitoring still happens. It continues okay. to do monitoring. And what signals do you pick from there? about these policies that I just these are, mentioned on the top of my these head. These are brilliant policies. You see, mm. for example, free SHS. Mm. Johnny, we underestimate the capacity of free SHS to deliver the kinds of skills, new skills, new literacy, and a new orientation mm. that this nation will have within 10 to 12 years of its implementation. Because what you are doing is that you are creating an entirely new generation of Ghanaians, mm. uh, 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 who otherwise would not have had access to these advantages and opportunities. Right. So that when you build that egalitarian platform where every family has access to education, then it means that in another generation, mm -hmm. 12 years, 15 years, 20 years, <coughs> every single family in Ghana has the opportunity to be impacted by literacy. And when you are impacted by literacy, what it means is that everything you do changes. The way you approach things, your analytical capacity, the new skills you bring, bring new opportunities, mm. bring new streams of potential income that a family can latch onto, and it changes families' lives. In the olden days, it used to be uh, traveling abroad. One, one person would be sponsored by the family to travel abroad, and mm. then he would take others along with them and mm. change mm. the nature of the farm. Now, it's, it's not like that anymore. Now, it's a knowledge economy that we live in. Mm -hmm. Now, countries live or die, not based on how much raw material they have, how, much, uh, how, uh, how big their labor force, but on the quality of that force, the skills, that the knowledge base. That question about the quality of the cohorts that we're churning out from free SHS. Yes. Some say that because we do not, for example, uh, have a certain... Uh, gatekeeping mechanism, mm. whether you pass from the JSS well or not, you have a secondary school to attend. And then at the end of your free SHS, your test score seems more important to the government, or if you like, those who speak on behalf of government, than the quality, what has been imbibed into you. See, we've been test scores based for years. Mm. 
when I was young, I did the common entrance at six years. Mm. Uh, what do you call it? In class six, at 11 years. Right. We've been test course based. And then you go to the university and you do the GCO level, you do the A level. A level. Now we do the uh, WASI. SHS, WASI, yeah. SHS, WASI and all that. The key examination that progresses you beyond into tertiary, beyond the second level into mm. tertiary, is the WASI. And the past two qualifying exams, as the president himself has observed, mm. have been very good. There's nothing wrong with using test scores uh, to define and determine uh, the level. That's standardized across the world. Mm. That's the only way you can compare. And these exams are not uh, uh, implemented in Ghana only. They are, we subscribe to a West African system. Uh, that's why it's called that's the West African exam. Yeah. And for two years running, Test scores, on average, are well above 50% mm. on all the core subjects. What more could we ask for? I think we are doing very well but in then terms the, of the mm, quality mm. of those coming out. But, of but the then program. the next question is, did mm. we plan for them for continuous education into the tertiary institutions? We read about accommodation problems. We read about uh, infrastructural problems at our universities and all of that. Did we, did we plan for them? For as thinking? far as I'm aware, mm. Hughes, as we speak, Government has invested in excess of a thousand structures across from basic level mm. to tertiary level. And, and as we speak, over 538 or so of them have been developed fully. Mm. So the tertiary level will have its share of challenges because we can't deliver all the infrastructure overnight. But we are getting there. We are working very hard towards it. Mm. And of course, when you do hostels and otherwise, you also open the opportunity for private sector uh, to participate. Is that happening? It is happening. Mm. The major universities, all the public universities have uh, hostel uh, mm. connections mm. and from the private sector. And all. If you go to Legon, you go to uh, Tech, UCC, Tech and all that, you see all UDS. of them there. But, but the argument is, is, should we wait to deliver infrastructure mm. to the max before we enable access because what then is the max how do we determine what the max is we extrapolate and, and give percentages and then what is available will set and stagnate you see that is why at some point we invented uh, uh, the double track okay because then uh, instead of the schools being left empty in between vacations you would have the facilities in continuous use okay. and and then you can get everybody on board mm. because whose child should stay at home nobody's child ought to stay at home when there's an opportunity to go and sort yourself out so now we have free tv as mm. they are progressing uh, i think the issues around the free shs are settling reasonably well mm. and so now the the challenge as they exit into the tertiary level is where we must look at you have free tv emphasizing technical education mm. and then you have the traditional uh, uh, universities mm. as well uh, and so we should look to see how they progress and, and as they go into those mm. institutions what we can do by way of augmenting infrastructure uh, needed infrastructure the methodologies we can use mm. uh, to provide all that. what does the MPP say to the proposal that don't make this an open policy but you can zone so that people like you and I who can afford to pay fees of our wards um, should be exempted from uh, getting it for free so that those who actually need it pay for it. What is your Johnny, position? It's a right? conversation that we can have. Mm. It's a conversation that's not out of place, but it's not a precondition. That's my view. Mm. Where we were, there was an urgency. What the, 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 the first year of implementation, for example, you took 400,000 people mm. off the streets, mm -hmm. of homes where they were deprived and they couldn't have gone in. So now you are jumping from uh, 800,000 to 1.2 million. That's 50%. It's a significant leap. So, so uh, whilst you need to have these conversations going forward, I think they can run along with mm. the implementation. But once we've started implementation, and the first situation that we should be happy about mm. is that the output has been good. If scores on average are above 
uh, over two years scores on average above 50 percent in the core areas then the output is good so now you begin to look at augmenting mm -hmm facilities, mm. uh, uh, determining whether or not you want to move to a needs-based policy. What you're talking about is a needs-based right. policy. That's right. Those who can afford. And of course, you have churches which had scholarship programs, you had private sector companies which had uh, uh, scholarship programs and all that. And, and maybe, perhaps, they should be encouraged to move them into some sort of, yes, <coughs> whether it's generalized or whether we want to break it down back mm. Mm. to parents, uh, individual parents and it's a bit more complex right. when you break it down to family level mm. uh, we have to establish a needs-based uh, situation but you also have the extra situation where you can nationalize it and, and, and create an avenue a source for those who want to contribute uh, to contribute so that it is transparently managed pool and of resources, invested. Right. Yes, I see. It's now, something like a private get fund, uh, right. more uh, or less. I, I know <laughs> that the president uh, Akufuado had said, for example, that he would work closely with his party mm. and would actually set time aside to be in the party office to work at least a day for that. I think one week, uh, once every two weeks, or once every month. Does he do that? Off and on, he does try. Okay, but he never misses mm. a party meeting. That's different from working from the party yes. office. Yes, and, and that press of work, you know, he's two years running ECOWAS president. Mm. So anytime he's had the opportunity, he's come to headquarters mm. to engage party people. But apart from that, like I said, he also comes to the party headquarters where all our meetings are held. And we have three meetings that he doesn't miss. Mm. The steering committee, the national executive committee, national council. And also, of course, the national conference. That's he right. never misses any of the party. What do you say to those who say that, look, we see the MPP or we saw the MPP as the elitist party, capitalist party, as the, the creme de la creme, the brightest and best, the lawyers, the doctors, engineers. Now it looks like it's become a party where uh, everybody just gets in there. People will pick on... Abronia, DC, Chairman, I want to make apologies to them. I'm sure you've had those conversations. And that a certain standard that is expected of the NDC, MPP is, is dropping and that the party should be alarmed at it. Are you alarmed? Is it true? Anyway? Perhaps, perhaps it's a characterization that was never true okay. in the first place. About yeah. the, the elitism. The bougie. Uh, exactly. Because... Uh, uh, this is a party that has been very sensitive to the needs of Ghanaians. Mm. This is a party that right from the beginning has pushed participation. Even after independence, when liberalization was unpopular, when democracy was unpopular, the era when authoritarianism was riding high, mm. civilian authoritarianism as well as military authoritarianism, the MPP's forebears was pushing freedoms, mm. freedom to associate, freedom to move, freedom to uh, speak freedom of speech uh, 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 all the freedoms that make democracy worth it mm. and today those freedoms are in being and they are priceless mm. they are priceless uh, uh, and once you have those freedoms it means everybody is available to engage everybody can associate everybody can move a fertilization of ideas like what's happening now everybody is saying what they believe and think even within the MPP you have people with discordant voices about government policy and all that. Freedoms are what drive choice. But there are consequences choice, for those people. Yes, but yeah, beyond this, I'm just mm. making the broader thing that choice is good for democracy. Okay. Because that is how come the Fourth Republic has lasted 30 years. This is the first time we really have had the opportunity to mm. test the limits of our freedom. Mm. And now we are governing in a glass house. Mm. Because every single decision you take, somebody has something to say about it in real time. Sometimes you are forced to take a decision that you may even have to back off from, retract. But it is all because it is participatory, it is open, mm. and people can express themselves. This is priceless. <laughs> uh, uh, Johnny, let me take this opportunity to state. Go ahead, please. The mm. trend. Mm across West Africa, in the Sahelian region, mm. of, of military uh, right. interventions. Mali, yeah. Guinea, As Burkina much Faso. as possible, ought not to be encouraged. And I've heard people in Ghana who are riding on the back of that and, and saying things that really will not aid us in mm. going forward. Mm. 
if you get the freedoms and military rule does that what happens is that you get bottled up and nothing new happens mm. uh, 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 we were bottled up for several years different coups we had in excess of five right uh, different more coups. than five actually yes if you count the mini mm. <laughs> the, the sub ones the, the sub ones yes the, the palace mm. ones as well literally from 66 72 all the way to 81 81 mm. And, and from 81 to uh, 92, mm -hmm. uh, we had a re full-fledged revolutionary government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And after that, we went back into a democracy from 92 to 2000, when it was being managed by the revolutionaries. Frankly, it didn't solve all our problems. But the, but the same problems are being re-echoed today. So the point I'm So making, what has changed? The point I'm making is that, no, if, if you look at the statistics, <coughs> sorry. If you look at the economic statistics, if mm. you look at uh, uh, growth, if mm. you look at all the human development indices, this 30-year period of democracy has been better than before. It has been better than before. We've slashed poverty from 53 percent down to 21 percent. Mm. The economy has grown from a very poor country, hippic, uh, to a middle-income country. We have a nominal. GDP in excess of 400 billion mm. now, as we speak. So all the indices have gone up in this period, but we haven't solved all the problems because we need to also do fundamental changes to the way we run our mm. systems. Mm. And those fundamental changes include the arguments going on now about what we do with ourselves, whether we raise the revenue internally or we go to the IMF to get things done. So what I'm saying is that Democracy mm. in its worst form, with all the participation, the loud engagement, the opinions, some extreme, some within, is far better than hankering after authoritarian rule mm. by the military or by a civilian president. So, 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 so we as a country must encourage our example to our other countries within ECOWAS. Now we have a president who is president of ECOWAS mm. for two terms. We must encourage that example to the outside world. Because we've also seen the coups. We've also seen the revolution, just like they have. And, and we've managed to operate together. And nobody has stressed. Uh, the NDC has taken power. The MPP has taken power. We've alternated. Civil society has grown up and has become one of the loudest forces. The media. Mm. Eh? Nowadays, when I listen to you, I even panic. Why? Be, hey, Why do you panic? The way, the way you... Uh, uh, papa. You know Papa? <laughs> <Fun>. <laughs> what mm. you used to fan mm. uh, 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 charcoal. Mm. <laughs> you, right. you, you've seen it. Right. right. When you fan I, it, then I, the charcoal goes bright red. This is a, uh, it's, then it's you a come core for accountability. <laughs> <laughs> you fan government's charcoal to it's, it's bright it's, red. It's a core for accountability. I enjoy it. Mm. But, but this is a facility that you wouldn't have if we're back in military war. Mm. And they won't give us a panacea. They won't solve our current problems. Where we are now, mm. we must, as a country, Ghana, set up and decide the way to go. Mm? If we are not going to go for coups, is the IMF the solution? Are we going the right direction? Yes. So let's discuss it. Is the IMF the solution? Mark Isibaya, Dr. Mark Isibaya, who is uh, your former committee chair of finance in parliament, says... Go to the IMF because whatever you hope to raise from the E levy uh, will not materialize. You just get five billion, but if you go to uh, what do you call it, the IMF, you get some more. What it, do you say? What do you say it's to his him? opinion, which he's entitled to, mm. but I'll disagree with him on the facts that when the NDC went to the IMF in 2015, mm. the 16th time we were going to the IMF, they were giving them 913 million dollars over three years. Performance based. Mm. Now, the performance based is cut spending, cut waste, increase revenue. These are the performance indices. That's right. Over three years, $913 million, less than a billion dollars. E Levy can raise a billion dollars in a year. He says that is false. How does he determine that it's false? Says that is false How as does well. he determine it's false? Mm. How does he determine He said you have estimated, but the reality <laughs> is that you're not going to get. 6.9 billion. His, his opinion mm. cannot be the reality beyond the scientific estimates of the finance ministry. So, so the advantage too is that 
you raise this money internally and you can continue the programs that are enhancing the welfare of your people. You can continue to educate your people and infuse new skills into them. You can continue to construct your roads. Mm. You can continue to encourage employment. You can continue with your 1D, 1F factories. You can continue restructuring your SOE sector. You can continue to expand access to opportunities in the economy mm. whilst raising this money and investing. In Someone will say you, 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 have borrowed to too, you have borrowed too much more than what you are going to hope to raise from the e yeah. levy. But, but if you if couldn't I get do to the borrowing matter, when, mm. when, when you go to the IMF, mm. apart from the money not being enough to solve your problems, they cut off all your investments in your people. That's the difference. So, for example, we're losing 5.3 billion SOEs at declaring losses. 5.3 billion. So IMF will ask you to keep an eye on it. So, so why so don't you do that at home? Exactly. Then? So I was coming to that. That mm. if it comes to the IMF, they are talking waste and increasing revenue. Right. And that's what the government has promised and is doing already. The government is cutting expenditure by 20% mm. on its own budget. Yes. The government is doing monitoring, strong monitoring on tax revenues through race mm -hmm. you've heard of race mm -hmm. yes uh, revenue accountability right, right. compliance uh, enforcement mm. which is being managed by the gra GRA. yeah the government has pledged to stamp down on waste apart from that the government must raise revenue now some say that it's enough to deal with the waste because the auditor general's report shows mm -hmm. figures right. exactly uh, you see but but it's a catch it's a catch-22 situation whilst dealing with the Auditor General's report, you need to continue paying mm -hmm. your bills. Your, uh, your, you need to service your debts. You need to pay your statutory uh, bills. You need to pay compensation. You need to invest in your flagship programs. Mm -hmm. So it is a process that must go alongside. In any event, it may still, even without anything at all, the waste alone may still not be enough to cover all your expenditure. So you need to raise revenue. Now, what are the sources of revenue? External borrowing and domestic, revenue. domestic taxes mm. and borrowing. External borrowing, literally. We are at the point where you are now mentioning that they say we've borrowed too mm. much. It depends. On what? There's a statistics of relative borrowing mm. uh, uh, where the NDC uh, taking on a national debt of 9 billion ended up giving us 122 billion. Mm. And that's over 1,300% okay. in mm. borrowing. Between then and now, we, compared to the NDC, have put on 281% in borrowing. Mm. In which, nominal which is terms. what percentage? 281%. Okay. Compared to the 1,300-something percent okay. in borrowing. Mm. But it is relative. It is relative in the sense that your borrowing must invest and expand the economy. Have you done that? If you look at what we are doing with improvement in human capital, mm. investments in education, investments in health, including the ambulances you just mentioned mm. yourself, the completion of uh, vital uh, health facilities, mm. the expansion in the uh, 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 recruitment mm. of health professionals and all that, then yes, we are investing in skills to build our human capital. Your critics say you borrow to chop you don't borrow to use for, for anything you see, you, you see, if you borrow to chop. You see, again, it's the wedding. Because we are in participation, mm -hmm. one can say borrow to chop. If I spend 400 million cities on school feeding in a year, have I chopped the money? Really? That's serious money. That is 400 million cities. If I spend 400 million cities on average over five years, how much is that? And it is going to increase the quality of my human resource. Children who would otherwise never go to school. And when they go, they get a nutritious meal. It opens their minds. And they enjoy schooling because the meal drives them there. 400 million. They've chopped it. They've chopped it. Mm. If I pay 200 million in training allowances, teachers and nurses. Mm. Have I chopped the money? If I pay 70 million cities a month mm. to support NAPCO trainees, 100,000 graduates who were desperate 
for recognition, dignity after finishing school. 100,000. If I pay 70 million a month, sustaining them and trying to transition them into jobs, mm -hmm. have I chopped the money? If I am taking all our children to school, mm -hmm. hmm, spending two billion on it, am I chopping the money? You see, we must look at the objects and the purpose for what we are doing. Can we do everything? We have the same, a plan. Can we do everything we at the same time? Not, but it's a process. But it looks like the MPP has its hands on too many things at the same time. We have an integrated plan. That's why. We have an integrated but does plan. the taxpayer have what it takes to support it? It's the politician's dream, but it's the taxpayer's burden. That is why Ghana is at a crossroads where we have to determine whether we'll fund ourselves internally or we'll go back to the IMF and cut off everything we are doing to help ourselves. Mm. That is why the E-Levy debate must be dispassionate. That is why it shouldn't be dependent on political talk like they've chopped the money and they are corrupt and those words come easy when but, you're but in opposition. But those things are things that you said when you were in That's opposition. That's why I say that it comes easy when you're in opposition. <laughs> I just said it, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> we're all guilty of it. Mm. Those things come in opposition. Mm. But confronted by the reality of the developing economy paradigm, mm. Mm. one has to really take innovative measures really innovative measures, which mm. means you are challenged by trying to catch up with the rest of the world and at the same time bringing up so many vulnerable people. Poverty. Poverty. Stark poverty for so many people. So you have a budget that must go into social services mm -hmm. in order to build social capital. Is the government at its wit's end? Absolutely not. If it were, we wouldn't be proposing e-levy and engaging the country but, on it. But it does appear that you want to use the e-levy as security to borrow some more because if you're looking at how much you spend for free SHS, planted for food and jobs, one district, one factory, one village, one dam, all of those ones, the quantum of funds that we we'll need will be more than what you're hoping to raise from the e-levy. So the argument is that then you're hoping to raise seven billion from here and then you will use that to say, over the next four years, this is how much I will get. Over the next 10 years, this is how much I'll get. Give it to me ahead while I spend and pay. Is that what you're you, intending to do? Do you appreciate what a catalyst is? But first, answer my question. Is that what government is intending no. to do? No. To use the e-levy as security for borrowing? Government has stated specifically mm. what it's going to use e-levy resources for. And that use will serve as a catalyst to whip the economy into high gear. That is roads and jobs. Roads, jobs. Mm. Because jobs generate. But CST and, and was supposed to create jobs as well. Yeah, but Communication CST, service tax. CST, all that it did is there for public scrutiny. Tell the public it about it. It hasn't probably raised enough. But tell the, pub, tell the public oh, yeah. about it. it. Went, Give them your scorecard. On CST? Yes. It's gone into uh, supporting the uh, youth employment programs, mm. YE mm. and other mm. programs. Mm. And then it's, of course, supported the vulnerable, socially vulnerable. You understand? So, so it is not money that has been lost. But is it the, is it, accounted sorry, for. Sorry, in, YB, is the MPP, for example, the MPP government able to say, okay, we have created X number of jobs, sector by sector, like you did in the results fair, like you did delivery.gov, yes. so that people can see we can. your scorecard. The and then that will there. serve as impetus. The information is to there. Gather. So, so publish it. Yes, the information it. is there. We will, we will publish it. In, when, our, in, when our, will 20, in our 2020 manifesto, mm. it actually details everything. Mm. Where... Uh, uh, we've created in excess of 2 million jobs. Mm. It's there. All the sectors are there. Right. So we republish. Uh, sometimes it's important that you repeat information. Mm. But genuinely, we have created jobs. We have created jobs in the educational sector with, do, uh, with the double, uh, double what, track, double track mm. uh, new teachers, uh, other service providers, we created jobs there. Mm. We created jobs again in the educational sector with the investment in infrastructure. Created jobs for contractors. Mm. Huh? Created jobs for service providers. Created jobs for vendors of the various materials used in construction. Over 500 structures in Indirect completed. jobs. You Indirect mean. jobs. Okay. We created all But those that. ones are not sustainable jobs. Why are they not sustainable? If they, we keep building. If you are building a thousand structures, you finish 500. You haven't done. You are, you are still building. Mm. We are still building roads. We but then the contractors say you are not paying them to be able to pay their people. So if jobs, you say I created jobs and created, then they are, they are not getting the money. We created jobs mm. 
in the medical sector, okay. employing right. nurses who had been sitting at home since 2012. Right now, we are up to date. Everybody who comes out of school is immediately employed. Is that so? Yes. Yes. Go to the ministry and find out. Mm. So, so we are also creating jobs. Again, indirect jobs with the construction sector, the roads. If you construct over 1,500 kilometers of roads uh, over the past four years and another 1,400 planned, that's substantial. Mm. It creates jobs. Now, the question of paying the contractors. That's right. And that is where we are now. That we as a government are saying that the way we finance our development needs, we need to build fiscal capital. We need to build social capital. Mm. We need to build economic capital. Mm. And we are departing from a position where the people of the country themselves may not have the wherewithal. So how do we do it? Over the years, we have two models. We export raw materials. The income from that is woefully inadequate mm. in modern times. Okay? <coughs> and then we borrow abroad. Mm. We've realized that it's not sustainable. We impose taxes. We've realized that it's, there's a limit. In fact, now we can't even impose fuel taxes. Well, the fuel itself is subject to inflation from post-COVID, uh, worldwide inflation mm. pressures and trends. So what do we do? And we are saying that, one, we must maintain investments in building social capital. It's not negotiable. Mm. Children must go to school. So free SHS must continue. Access to tertiary level must continue. Free TVET must continue. But you need the skills. And then you come to the economic sphere, mm -hmm. the real sector, mm -hmm. where we are trying to change agriculture, commercialize agriculture, mm -hmm. with the various programs in agriculture. So you make more money in agri. And it, it, it dovetails with 1D, 1F, where we are establishing factories, factories that will complement the agricultural sector and produce things that we otherwise import like fruit juices and, and oh, but all, all of those ones are behind schedule one district one factory is behind schedule it is, uh, it is a hundred and planting for food and jobs for example in the first year announced that seven hundred and forty five thousand jobs have been created yes can we go back and look at how many jobs you have mean, been created it is an extra hundred and ten factories that we didn't have five years ago that's important and hopefully another 200 and 80 thereabouts in the pipeline. Some of those factories Almost already done. existed. We refurbished them. Yes, it's important. If they existed and it was dead, that's why you're using the word refurbish. If, if the Haku Farms, an icon mm. like the Haku Farms, was mm. dead, and the government partners the Haku Farms and invests to refurbish the Haku Farms, it's virtually like any factory. The Casa Preco was working. And it has expanded tremendously. So we cannot exactly say that these are 110 factories that didn't exist and we got them. No, no, no. No, no, no. The, the concept from the beginning, there are also brand new ones, Casa de Ropa and all mm. that. The, the concept from the beginning was to give a fillip to the private sector okay. industrialization process. Mm. Because don't forget, we have the public sector one, which is not performing to the SOE sector. They, it has its own, mm. which we are now trying to uh, get going very strongly. You understand? But you set, up SIGA, you set up SIGA, it's, yes. it's, it, they're still declaring losses. 2018, they declare yeah, losses. SIGA, 2019, they declare losses. 2020, they declare SIGA losses. SIGA is strengthening. The trend of losses are coming down. You don't only have Rather, SIGA. it's going up. Oh, SIGA is, is strengthening. In 2020, it was uh, $5.3 The yeah. year before that, it was less than that. Because, because they have uh, high flies, mm. and then you have some very difficult ones. So now SIGA has to face up to the situation, whether you apply direct private sector principles in there or not, kill off the mm. very desperate ones right. and enhance the capacity of the high What is the position ones. of the of the party and the government? Well, I, I think we support SIGA. Mm. Uh, we support SIGA in the Air Force. The, 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 the leadership, the new leadership of SIGA has very clear plans on what it wants to do. Mm. And then the minister of state in charge is mm. in sync right. with them. But, but there's, a, there's also the concept of meritocracy mm. put people who are qualified they're not people who are party people have supported the party it's not necessarily party people it's, it's probably about supervision and performance uh, how do i put it because uh, hitting their kpis if, if you are the kpis must result in some sort of sanctions right because if you are in the public sector you're mm. in a business for the public <laughs> you should operate as a business you mm. can't we can't transfer civil 
uh, civil, civil service uh, nonsense, attitude. Mm. Oh, because you are in the public sector, you are managing director of uh, a public corporation, you are safe. You mm. cannot be sacked, mm. irrespective of your performance, because you are employed by the government. The staff are not accountable. They can come to work anytime they like. Mm. Mm. You know, they are not protecting the assets well and all that, because they are government. So, so you need to change. Can you the would you support a proposal, for example, to say you are declaring losses over the years, you are managing director, CEO of a state-owned enterprise. We are cutting off, we're cutting part of your salary until you achieve your KPI. We are cutting off. Part like of like your I said, um, Ambassador Edwin Boating mm. is a new <laughs> director general, SIGA, and right. he has very clear ideas mm. what he wants to achieve. But would you support a pay cut, I, I for example, for CEOs that are declaring losses. I will support the program that Mr. Boatin puts in place. But cutting the salaries will save us money. It's a single thing. It's not within the larger picture. So I'm not in a position to, <laughs> you know, As a push. party communications director, would yes, you advise I can, him? I, I can't sit here and say, oh, cut would, no, would you advise him people. to do that? He has a program. Hmm. And I will have opportunity to input into that program. But until I do, mm. I'm not in a position. I see. To. The president has been very minimal on reshuffles. Mm. What is the party's position on that? It's a president's prerogative. But, Appointments are the president's prerogative. But he comes to the party office to work. What do yes. you tell him when he comes? Do you tell him it's time to do a reshuffle? We respect, we respect the president's views on, on governance. Mm. And we input as and when. So there are prerogatives of the president. Appointments are the president's prerogative. Mm. We make input as and when, as a party. But it remains the president's prerogative. What signals are you picking on the ground regarding the general management of the economy on the ground? I know you're a grassroots person. The people on the ground, yes. what, what do they tell what, you? What is happening now, mm. and, and the president is very frank about it, and we all accept it, is that the COVID economy is hard. I mean, and, and if I have a little time, I'll try to explain. Right. Before COVID, the world was coasting. The era of cheap money, uh, negative interest rates. <coughs> Sorry. Know, everybody was giving money away mm. all over the world. Then COVID hit, and the impact of COVID, supply chain disruptions, demand failures, mm. <laughs> and of course, increased expenditure in a particular sector, health, and, and its accoutrements, including even research mm. on vaccines and all that. In Ghana, the UNDP and World Bank reports, uh, supported by ISE and other institutions, mm -hmm. say that 770 people in the private sector mm, suffered wage cuts mm -hmm. during that period. Another 700,000 mm -hmm. suffered cuts to their working hours, mm -hmm. implying wage cuts as well. Mm -hmm. Over 42,000 lost their jobs outright. Okay. Now, these are people who are supposed to be work, who are any a certain level of, and in a society like ours, which is so dependent mm -hmm. on breadwinners, you okay. find yourself within a period of a year unable to provide for your family. Okay. Then production within the country itself is also limited by yeah. COVID. Okay. Because you can't go to work, but government tries to pay all public sector workers with or without their full work. So government pays that. But you are now in a situation where your businesses are shut down. The informal sector suffers the most. Your business are shut down. You are not getting a salary. And therefore, you are unable to participate effectively in economic activity. Then we go beyond that and import external inflation. Because externally, they are also sub experiencing supply chain disruptions. Demand is down. Uh, companies are finding it difficult accessing credit and all that. Mm. So whatever little they are producing, it's expensive now. Mm. Inflation is hitting the world because of uh, COVID. If you check UK, their uh, energy prices have doubled. There are pressures. There are pressures on inflation all over. Things are really expensive. Then you go out there as a businessman in Ghana and import these expensive things. Shipping is expensive. Uh, 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 container, co container costs have quadrupled from 2,000 to about 8,000. Some are in excess of 14,000 for a 40-footer from about 6,000 to 8,000. Now, 14,000. Then shipping costs have increased. Mm. So you bring this stuff in and you bought it expensively, you transported it expensively, and you bring it onto the market. You have to sell to recover your cost. The person you are selling to 
is also experiencing low demand because they are not working. COVID has hit the food sector. It has mm. hit the hotel mm. sector, the informal sector, the educational sector, where many children, private school people couldn't afford to pay their teachers. They had to uh, shut down. During the shutdown, they couldn't pay and they put them all off. So experiences that a large chunk of the population would have taken as normal before COVID is now abnormal. People are unable to pay their rent. <laughs> you understand? Mm. Yes. So, so when you have such a situation, it's difficult. But that is why we are saying that in that kind of situation, it's not a difficulty imposed by government policies. These difficulties are a reality of the post-COVID recovery worldwide. Mm. Because COVID has introduced inflationary pressures due to the disruptions in supply chains. Are we not exaggerating because you keep announcing no. to us that we have hit our revenue targets, for example? Yes. So if we keep hitting our revenue targets, yes. and then you are telling us that people are not working and so everything else yes. is uh, not the way it's supposed to be because yes. of COVID, yes. how do you put the two together? The, the revenue targets you are hitting hmm. don't meet our requirements as a nation. The revenue targets are 12 to 13 percent of right. GDP. Right. They don't meet our requirements mm. as a nation. So, so that we should be clear about. But you have that we are meeting our revenue targets mm -hmm. doesn't mean that we are achieving all we can. But then it means that then you are at a point where you can't borrow anymore because your name is not good out there. That is where I have a difficulty with the international financial architecture. Now, who F first of all, first mm. of all, the government itself has decided to reduce expenditure and match revenue to payments. Mm -hmm. In other words, if the money doesn't come in, it will not pay or commission projects. That is a self-regulatory measure. That's very important. But the international financial architecture operating the same as before COVID mm -hmm. is a disadvantage and unfair to the third world developing economies because first world development first world economies fully developed fully fledged economies can borrow <laughs> without any limits mm. the american uh, public debt is in excess of 30 trillions and they are still investing more money giving out freebies and all that you understand japan they, they are in excess of 200 300 200, over 200 percent uh, debt to gdp ratio they are still there and they are working. One will say that it's because they have the productive base mm. so they can meet their uh, demands. But, but to, 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 for all of us to have gone through austerity, the austerity Ghana went through in order to recover from mm. the last IMF program and to be hit by an unexpected thing like COVID and then to be asked to maintain the same standards as before, immediately and even during COVID, when we are still trying to uh, exit COVID, it's not fair to developing economies because but, you are stifling those economies. But Ghana Beyond Aid should not be worried about this. Ghana Beyond Aid would be worried if we don't develop internal revenue mechanisms. But you said that, you, are you said that in 2016, 2017, 18, 19, 20, 2021. We're in 2022. 20, COVID came in 2020. 20, yes, 2017. We inherited an IMF program started by the NDC right. in 2015. Mm. We still had to operate within the remit of that. Mm. So what did we do? We had to resolve the energy sector issues. We had to resolve the banking sector crisis. We had to immediately reprofile our debts. So there and then, if you recall, uh, we had to borrow some money to reprofile our debts, and it ended up a charge mm. by the NDC. If you recall, that was a necessary emergency based on the program we have. We had to pay off all the depositors in the banks that we had to collapse. Some say they are still not being paid, by the they, way. I, I believe strongly that they will all be paid. So you're looking at when? 23 billion, mm. you're looking at 23 billion protecting over four and a half million depositors funds. I believe and I'm certain that everybody over time will get their funds mm. uh, paid. But we made that investment. We also made investment in rationalizing the energy sector. This was in the early days. Mm -hmm. And we also then implemented in the very first year our flagship program of free SHS. We didn't exit the IMF program till 2019. Mm. And even then... Before that, that was because you extended it. Because it had to be done properly. And 
the beautiful thing is that in implementing it, we were able to jump over the conditionalities. We were able to convince the IMF that our performance was good enough to enable us to hire people again mm. and to enable us to invest in paying for contracts. You understand? Mm. So we are managing... And now we are B, and the economy, B minus with the negative and the economy, outlook. That's why I'm saying it's unfair. Because the economy grew. The economy grew an average of 6.8% mm. up to 2019 and was built to go up to 8.8% when COVID hit. You, you understand? So this is an economy where we had managed to import 300, over 300 ambulances for the service of people across the country. Mm. This is an economy where we had put 1.2 million children in school. It's an economy where we are paying people to stay in training colleges and, 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 and teacher training colleges and nursing training colleges. An economy where we are employing people into the educational sector, into the health sector. It's an economy where we are investing in the real sector of the, uh, the private sector. Mm. Uh, yes, this is an economy that was functioning. So, 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 then so, the, so then COVID the, hit. So then some other economists will say, look, you came to meet what you say mm. was a dire situation. Yeah. You're trying to manage the dire situation to get better. Yes. And then you were still doing capital investment investments yeah. you are managing two different things at the same time because uh, when you didn't have the world without we can't afford to wait that's why we're at a crossroads that we must all take a decision johnny we can't afford to wait we can't sacrifice the schooling of our children to build factories who will man the factories if we train the children we don't build the factories where will they work it's it's a situation where we have to run together at the same time and above all we must find a way of paying for it internally because mm. in the post-covid world credit from abroad is going to be extremely expensive they are themselves entering an inflationary phase from zero percentage minus mm. zero one uh, interest rates before covid they are now shooting interest rates up so where we are now that's mm. why i'm saying that for, for you to be downgraded by Moody's, mm. eh, it's a traditional process. They are looking at the old time indices and all that. But exiting COVID at this time, given the challenges, mm. we are yet to restore the supply chain disruptions. We are yet to stimulate demand. Like I'm saying, people have lost their jobs. Those jobs have not been restored yet. The tourism sector. Uh, year of return, mm. which brought in in excess of a billion dollars, right? Mm. It's shut down suddenly after people have invested in the following year. It's shut down. Those people who are shut down, their jobs are so, not back. So what happens if the people, so, so their jobs the, are not back. If, if the minority does not agree to the E-Levy? What happens to it? Uh, uh, let what me happens if, you don't, if you don't let get the E-Levy? The, 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 the uh, what do you call it? Demand mm. is still low. So in that kind of situation, if Moody's uses the old-fashioned trends mm. to, 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 to check to out. To do the together. ratings. Then it's a bit difficult. So you disagree with Moody's? I, I disagree with the continued persistence of the old international financial architecture I hear you. based on the old principles. What happens, so if, you don't e get the, what happens if you don't get the E-Levy? I'm told that my, but I'm trying to... My understanding, my understanding is that the government can make do without the E-Levy. But it is a springboard. It's a catalyst that will point the way into the future. It's not as if it's the death of all of us. But given the E-Levy, uh, you avert a stoppage in the things that you are doing to satisfy your people. Uh, you threaten mm. access to education. You threaten access to quality health. You threaten roads. Some people say that's blackmail. After mismanaging the economy, you're blackmailing we're, people we, to pass the E-Levy. We haven't mismanaged the economy. We have accounted for everything we've done. I mentioned some of the figures your, to your you. Your CD is crippling before the dollar, the pound, the euro. You are, you are talking old economics again. You see, this is the Moody's economics yes, that the, we must understand. But the understand. person who goes to the Forex Bureau now yes. to go and swap his CD for a dollar yes. would just understand it from that perspective. That is why we must raise internal resources and invest in production so that we can create the jobs here and we can create the products here. You are going to buy a dollar. Mm. That came off the back of cocoa production. Eh? Mm. How much is it? So all these firms that are here who are working in cities are chasing that dollar. And some of them are willing to pay premium over the top mm -hmm. to get that single dollar we are all chasing. So the, 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 the too much money chasing the dollar means that it will depreciate. I see. Yes. Yeah, yeah, why be fi final question so, to so, you? So we end up importing on, on, everything. On there will always be pressure on On hindsight, would you say that the president perhaps padded the number of ministers that he had in the first term,
because we're going to pay all of them. Ask Chris, uh, all of those monies could have been used to do the things that you're doing now. <laughs> on, a hindsight, on a hindsight, no, on a hindsight. No, that's unfair. On a hindsight. That's unfair. That's unfair. unfair. The how? president said. On a hindsight. Uh, now I'm repeating. The president right. said mm -hmm. that it depends on the output he wanted from them. There were places he wanted a specific focus, and he achieved that. So by the second term, he believed that there were certain places that he could now bring into the presidency as secretariats rather than ministries. One million so constituency, for example, was not achieved. It's, it's under, it's, was it's, it achieved? You know, it wasn't achieved because of the fiscal space, the constricted mm -hmm. fiscal space, but it wasn't abandoned because the, the Ministry of Special Development Initiatives, which has now been set up as a secretariat in the presidency, mm -hmm. is still functioning. And it's functioning through the coastal development, middle belt, and northern mm -hmm. development authority. I hear you, YB. Thank you very much. I don't hear of breaking the eight these days. We will break the eight. We are starting the party elections, mm. and we are really focused on dealing with the post-COVID recovery I hear because you. it depends on it. Breaking the eight depends on it. So once mm. we finish the party elections and we open up the floodgates for campaigning, you will hear a lot about that. Will the vice president or organize a, a, a town hall meeting or a public lecture to talk about the e-levy, for example? At the moment, government is running I know, but meetings. when will the vice president speak? Do you know? I won't be surprised if he speaks any time because he, the vice president is known. He used to speak very, very much in uh, opposition yeah, about but, some of these things. But you keep uh, trying to uh, use opposition standards. I'm holding you to your own standards. I'm holding you to your own standards. Yes, we haven't. We are fighting. We haven't deviated from. I hear standards. you. Yabamia yeah, Samwa is the director of communications of the New Patriotic Party. He is also a private legal practitioner, former member of parliament for the Adentan constituency. He joined us here.